Welcome everybody, I'll unmute my mic. Okay, um, we're now recording this session. We're delighted to have Holly Derry joining us from Michigan. She stayed on late at work in order to be able to join us and share with us uh, some of the things that they've been learning at Michigan with the eCoach system. They're several years ahead of us. Uh, I mean, us collectively, I think. The Michigan team are the world leaders in the development and use of this technology. So. We're really delighted that Holly, who is the senior behavioral scientist there, is able to join us. And without further ado, Holly, we'll hand over to you and uh, look forward to hearing what you have to share. Thank you. And um, thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be um, to thought of so highly, especially maybe not the senior part, but um, but I appreciate that you your um, your interest in eCoach. Um, before my screen isn't moving forward. Okay. Before I start talking about eCoach, I wanted to just get some sympathy from all of you about the weather we've been facing. So I want to draw your attention to the orange boxes in the bottom where you have four suns in the orange box and we have zero suns. Admittedly, I took this screenshot a week ago last Friday, but it hasn't been much better here since then. And uh, in fact, we had a blizzard just yesterday. And just in case Fahrenheit doesn't mean anything to you, I also put it in Celsius. So there you go. Okay, so um, just to give you a sense of what I'm gonna be talking about for this portion, um, I went back and forth several times about what I might, how I might present eCoach to all of you. And I landed on um, describing it from the perspective of four different sets of users. So first I'll show you sort of what the students get. Then I'll, uh, I'll sort of talk about our relationship with instructors and how we work with them. Um, I'll spend some time talking about the perspective of writers and content managers, which is um, the space that I spend the most time in, as well as how we work with researchers. And um, I wanted to draw a couple of distinctions before I really dive in. So I'm a behavioral scientist. I'm not in the UX space or the LX space officially. Um, my background is in health communication. And so I spent 20 or so years thinking about tailored health communications for the sake of changing behavior, motivating people to do things they really didn't wanna do, um, working with um, decision aids, and when I moved into the higher ed space, I realized that some of those things were the same. There, it's still about decision making and motivation and behavior change. It's just a different space. The other thing that I wanted to mention was um, that our system might be a little different from some that you're envisioning because our messages are not written by instructors. They're written by me and other behavioral science folks. Um, I remember reading that on task, um, I believe had components that were meant to help instructors write to students and <clears throat> we don't do that. So that's one distinction I just wanted to call out. Also, eCoach is not about um, the material that's covered in a course. We don't dive into the topics that are covered in Physics 140 or Chem 130. We talk about the behaviors that lead to success in the course. So attendance, study habits, how they engage with the resources that are offered in the course um, to study for exams and so on. Also, in everything that I describe in the next um, few minutes, well, over the next 45 minutes or so, um, is how we have chosen to um, create eCoach or to, to construct our versions of eCoach, but the tool itself is extremely flexible. You can have way more messages than we offer or way fewer. You can send emails that are tailored or untailored or or whatever, you, the messages can be about whatever topic, they can be delivered via different um, methods. But um, so I guess that's just to say that the tool itself is flexible. It's not dictated by the way I'm about to describe it. Okay, so to start at sort of the 30,000 foot view, um, eCoach bridges a gap. So we are a tailored support program for large introductory courses where one-on-one -on -one communication between the instructor and the student is impossible. Tim McKay, our founder, tells this story about looking out across his um, 
uh, lecture auditoriums at around 300 faces, realizing um, that his assumptions had been wrong for many years. He thought that if he, he taught the information in the same way, that everyone out there was a blank slate and that they could all learn it if he said it the same way and was very consistent about his teaching methods. What he realized is that not everyone sitting out in his audience is the same. They aren't blank slates. Some have had better or worse teachers in high school. Some have had better or worse experiences with physics. Some have higher or lower math placement scores. And so his vision was to bring together the data that we know about all of our students, which is vast. Um, the technology that we have, which includes both eCoach as well as our tailoring system that was developed here at the University of Michigan. Um, and what we know about the course and our close relationships with the instructors to bring that together to help students focus on what's most important every week to place their own behaviors and, and scores in the context of the rest of the course to reflect on how things are going and change behaviors if they choose. Staying in this 30,000 foot view, this is um, kind of a look at the, the basic flow of, of eCoach. So this top box represents the instructors, the students, and myself um, who bring together insights and behavior strategies that make up the content. The box on the left is all the data that we have about students. Those come together in the middle box, which is the Michigan tailoring system. So we take all of the pieces that we want to talk about and all the data that we know about students and we match those up so that the students are getting the right information based on their, on their scores and psychosocial metrics. And then those are pumped out into the box on the right, which represents eCoach. So now coming down a little bit from 30,000 feet, I'll show you what the students get. So this is an overview of um, the homepage for eCoach. eCoach um, exists in the context of a course and every course that we have a coach in has its own individual coach. So this one, for example, is E283. Every course is a little bit different, every instructor is a little bit different, and so every instance of eCoach is a little bit different. But from the student perspective, what you can see is across the top, we have this big bar. Whenever there's a survey that they need to fill out, that will appear. The area in the upper left is what we call the featured message slot. And so every week we change up the main thing that we're talking to them about, and that's where that will live. Um, over on the right, the white box with the yellow um, visualization in it, that's brand new and actually we haven't even released that visual visualization to students yet. Um, and the point there is to break down the entire course for the whole term into points. The yellow, the solid yellow and the white represent the points that they have earned or missed respectively. And then the striped yellow and white area are the points that are still ahead of them. This has come up several times when, say, after exam one, people aren't getting the scores that they want and they feel like they're doomed and the, you know, their um, success is over. We can point to this chart and say, but after exam one, you still have 70 or 90% of the points left ahead of you. So it's meant to sort of keep up their energy to see that there's still a lot ahead of them and to stave off kind of that um, feeling that it's all over with one bad grade. Um, the quick links area are um, links that we can add out to other resources that are available in the course. Some of those are within eCoach and some of those are outside of eCoach. Um, then on the bottom left, you can see there's a to-do list um, that we have a different to-do list every week. Sometimes um, they're written by me. Sometimes they are written by instructors. That's one of the main areas that instructors do actually write content in eCoach. And then on the bottom right is um, the, it's a thumbnail view of the entire message center. <clears throat> and you'll see more of the, so those are basically just um, kind of linking out to the other eCoach messages that are available to them. The red dots mean they haven't read it, but you'll see more of those in a bit. This is a bird's eye view of how we structure a semester for each coach. Again, they're all a little bit different, but this is kind of the superset of things that we send out. 
So the yellow circles represent emails that we send to alert people that there's content in eCoach for them. Uh, and then the red diamonds are surveys. So, um, so we start the term with the beginning of term survey to find out um, some of the sort of psychosocial measures, barriers to, um, you know, what their motivations are, what they see as their strengths. And I'll, I'll show you a table that details some of the questions or some of the data we have about people in a bit. Um, then as soon as they're done with the beginning of term survey, we have a whole bunch of content available for, th for them right away. There's this period of time at the beginning of the semester when people are kind of hungry for information and they're willing to read a lot. And so we take advantage of that by having all the kind of generic, um, the information about the generic components of the course. Like, so Problem Roulette, for example, is um, a practice tool. Um, the what to expect example there refers to um, a set of messages that we have where the instructor kind of lays out what they ex what um, what the entire term looks like and how they've approached the term and giving students that insight is something they wouldn't normally get. Um, by the time we get around to week three, we're getting into some of the um, the content that we dole out over time to give it a little bit more attention and to not overwhelm them in those first couple of weeks. Controllable points is, um, was sort of an aha moment for us. We, were, we realized that instructors have this notion of um, points that are in a student's control. If they show up, if they do the work, if they've done the reading, if they're engaged in answering questions, that a lot of the points in the overall course are in their control. And so those represent more behaviors and habits than anything else. So we wanted students to really think about some of those points in that way. And so we differentiate those from exam points. And we really drive that home in this controllable points message and then late throughout the term in some of our other messages. The lighter blue um, message symbols are to represent that some, we, we have three computer science courses and those um, have projects and so we've also talked to the instructors about specific um, habits and behaviors and ways to approach projects that are that represent best practices and so we put those in messages as well when it comes to exams we have kind of a whole um, recipe around each exam about 10 days before the exam we open what we call the exam playbook i'll show you a picture of that in a little bit that's a, um, a strategy and planning tool that we have tested separately. And I'll show you some um, uh, research around that as well. And we also open up a tailored message that has pre-exam tips that we've gotten from the instructor but are tailored to the individual. After the exam, they, um, they reflect on what happened. We show them a histogram of the distribution of the entire course, how they did on the exam, as well as ask them some questions about how they feel about their score, how they feel about their studying, and um, some reflections on what they think they might do differently the next time. Um, and actually, my windows are covering up the other side of my screen, but I think it's just the end of term survey at the end. Okay, so here's a look at an individual message. So on the left, you have the message inbox that was um, a link from the home page, And so down the left are all the messages that someone will have gotten over the course of the semester. The, the message shown here is um, the tailored message that people get as they're getting ready for exam one. Um, depending on our connection to Canvas and, or whatever LMS, um, eCoach is fairly agnostic about LMS as we use Canvas here. So depending on our connection to Canvas in a particular course, um, this, the information that you see here can either be tailored so it explicitly tells them what their lab scores or pre-lab scores or homework scores are, or in this case I chose a self-tailored um, what I think of as kind of a metacognitive approach, which is that they have to make a, a determination about how they think they're doing in each of these areas. But the basic idea here is it says, um, before you're ready to start studying for your exam, you might need to catch up to see if there are any gaps in your learning. And then the second half of this message is, 
the best tips for studying for the exam based on what the instructor has told us. So this is the um, exam playbook. Um, like I said, this is a, a strategy and planning tool that was developed by um, Patricia Chen, who is now at um, the National University of Singapore. She did her pre-doc work here at Michigan. She did her postdoc at Stanford. And this started as a Qualtrics survey. And then after she did a randomized control trial, we incorporated it into eCoach. The basic just here is that um, it starts out there's a page before anything you see here that says um, your exam is coming up on such and such date. Take a moment to think about the kinds of questions that'll be on the exam. And then there's this list on the left, which shows all the resources available to study for the exam in that course. And then people check which ones they think they're going to use. The next step is that they write why, why they're going to use each of those or what value they think each will bring them. And then the page on the right is um, how they, they make their plan for when, where, and how they're going to use each tool. And then um, each item will populate in the calendar at the bottom, and then they can sync it with their Google Calendar. Um, we also have a pretty popular feature in eCoach, which is a grade calculator. When we have a grade about someone, it populates in the part on the left, and then you can see how their total grade um, adds up based on each of the components. And on the right, you can see just one bar. So if someone can click into one of the components and enter future grades to see what impact, say, the next two exams might have on their overall score. <clears throat> okay, so now I'll talk about the instructor, how we work with instructors, the instructor point of view. So these are the instructors from our eight um, courses. And um, together, they teach over 9,000 students every semester. So these are quite literally the biggest courses at U of M and you can imagine why they're glad to have something like eCoach helping them talk to their 9,620, I can't read the number, students. Oh, I just got my window to clear up. Okay, perfect. Okay, so the way we work with instructors, um, the first thing is that they guide the content. We talk to them about every other week if we're firing up a new coach, we talk to them a lot more frequently than that, but they help us for every week of the term figure out, figure out what the priorities are for the student. They might tell us um, what, what assignments are coming up. They might tell us um, which, um, how to engage with each, with each of those assignments. They kind of say, if someone's gonna get in the habit, a set of good habits for the semester, it's going to start in this these first couple of weeks and it's going to look like this. They should be doing these kinds of things before lecture, these kinds of things after lecture. Um, in those discussions with them, we also um, ask them things like, if you had a dollar for every time you told a particular thing to a student, what would that be? And then they share those stories with us, some of their best stories, worst stories, the things that the best students do or the worst students do. And then we can translate those into um, any message that eCoach can deliver. So that includes items in a to-do list, emails, text messages, uh, a full-size tailored message um, like the pre-exam one I showed you a minute ago, or testimonials like you see on the right. The instructors also help us recruit students and engage students. They, um, we ask them to put a blurb in their syllabus about eCoach um, they also uh, mention us and link to us on Canvas, as you can see on the right. They also sometimes will give it, uh, put out announcements in lecture. For example, when we've done a, a few big randomized control trials, they've helped us recruit more students that way. The biggest way they work with us is to give us extra credit um, for the components that we want to engage students in. If, if you look at how many students complete, read messages or complete a survey or complete the exam playbook in courses that do and don't have extra credit, it's, um, it's pretty amazing. They also give us new ideas. So name that scenario, which is listed on the left, is a particular study tool that our Stats 250 instructor came up with um, a few years ago. 
It lives in eCoach, but the concept is very applicable to really any course. And so we've moved it into Problem Roulette, uh, as, which is another study tool that delivers, that randomly delivers questions from old exams. And the concept behind Name That Scenario is that you get asked a question about a certain topic. And rather than working through the math or actually answering that question, the set of response options that you can pick from are topics in that course. So basically you're identifying what concept the question is asking about, which is just a kind of different way to study. Okay, the next section is my world. Um, so if I go on and on, you can all wave your hands or something. Um, but I wanted to give you some insight about how my team and I think about developing content for eCoach. Um, I, tr I worked really hard on my shortest ever elevator pitch, and it's this one. We deliver the right message at the right time in the right way. And I'm going to break those down into their three parts. So starting with the right message, um, we start by talking about what matters to the students. And we get some of that from the instructor insights. They tell us what they have heard students say over the years. They tell us what they overhear them saying and so on. We also go to the literature to find out what, why people do and don't engage in certain behaviors um, in terms of studying for a course. And of course, we also use all the data we have. And again, I'll talk about, I'll give you a picture of what, what kind of data we have in a second. And again, once we know what we want to talk about, we can decide what the best way is to deliver that message. If it's going to be a, a full on tailored message, uh, email or text, something in to do list. Um, sometimes we decide whether we want to show them visualizations or histograms of the class. And sometimes we deliver full scale interventions. This is um, a chart of uh, describing some of the data that we have from our data warehouse. We know what year they are in school, their ACT scores, demographics, GPA from other courses. From Canvas, we know their grades and assignments, um, and we can know anything that's missing if they get zeros, for example. And also whether they're attending lecture and lab based on uh, clicker scores. Uh, the student survey column represents what we ask students in eCoach. So it's either from that beginning of term survey or any surveys that we might deliver along the way. We find out things like what grade they want to get in the class, how motivated they are to get that grade, how confident they are, how important it is to get that grade, whether they consider themselves a perfectionist, uh, detail oriented, uh, procrastinator, and so on. We also have some other sources that we can bring in. So sometimes we can get data from Problem Roulette, which is that practice tool. Sometimes we can get information from uh, the computer science department's auto grader or uh, a homework system that is, you know, sort of a, a different tool that students use. And if we can get that data, it might include things like when they first submitted their computer science project to the auto grader. So we know when they're starting their work. If it's really close to the deadline, we might give them a certain message telling them to go earlier. Um, if they're starting early enough, but they're still really struggling or they're not submitting frequently enough, that might be a different kind of message. Okay, this is, um, this is an example of something I do when I'm training new staff, behavioral science staff in particular. So when um, my colleague Carly and I were writing a new message, I realized that this is the way we think about it, about not only the core of the message, but also how, what we might want to tailor on and, and how the core of the message might be different for different people. And so, so the first cut that I made here is that there's one table for people who are caught up on their assignments and one table for people who are not caught up. And so, in this example, we were writing a pre-exam message to decide, you know, the main points we were going to, the main message we wanted to deliver to students. And so I've highlighted a couple of boxes that I thought were the most interesting. So group one are caught up on their work. They're confident that they can get the grade that they want and that grade is an A. So that group is 
maybe not very interesting, but they're the ones that you can say, okay, you're, you're doing all the work, you're doing the right things, you wanna get an A, here's the best way to study for the exam. Group two is doing all the work, but they said they wanna get a C and they're confident that they can do that. So I think this group falls into possibly two separate kinds of categories. So one is that maybe they're just not trying very hard Maybe there are three possibilities. One is that they're, they may not be really pushing themselves. And so our message might say to them, like, well, we think you might even be able to do better. What would it look like for you to put in a little bit extra work? Um, or they might not have answered the survey earnestly, in which case they just randomly picked answers. That is always a possibility that makes my soul hurt, but yet it's a possibility. Um, and I think the third possibility could be that they're taking the class pass fail, in which case I would want to tailor on that because I think we know that as well. But you can kind of get the idea of how those two groups might be different. And then if you look at the not caught up side, group three wants to get an A, they're confident they can do it, but they're not doing the work that will ultimately help them get the A in the class. There's a chance that they will still get an A. And so you can imagine how you would wanna further tailor this message based on their actual score. So if their score is already a 98, maybe they're right. Maybe they are gonna get the A and we don't need to say anything to them. But if their score is fairly low, we might tailor differently. And then group four is probably the most challenging one. So they wanna get a C, uh, but they're not confident they can do that. And I have to say, we've found that anybody who says something lower than an A in their goal grade, um, they're, they're a very different group. It's not many people, most people say A or A plus. And so if you say a C, that your goal is a C, you're already starting out at, in, in kind of a disadvantaged group. Um, and, and if you're not confident you can get that, then to me, that's a warning sign and our data shows that's a warning sign. And so we might work with the instructors to say, what should we say to these people? We might look back over time and, you know, we probably need to, to think even more strategically about this, but, but you can imagine how it would change the message that you send to people for each of these different groups and how you might want to tailor additionally for each group on say actual score or how important it is for them to get the grade or, um, whether they're taking a pass fail. And as you can imagine, anytime you add another tailoring characteristic in here, you're you know, multiplying these tables by that number of more permutations. And it's possible, but it's just a lot of work. Okay, the next part is um, that we think a lot about time and when to deliver certain messages. So again, here's that bird's eye view of the semester. Um, as I said, you know, we work very closely with the instructors to figure out when the right time is to send some of this out. Here's an example of some of the, um, the timed doled out messages versus the supporting messages. So some classes have a writing exercise. That's the MWrite example in the upper left. Um, some courses want to say certain things about their textbook. You can, if, as you look across, you can see there are some things in common, some things are different. This is just a case of how every instructor wants to highlight different things um, and have different components in the class. One thing that we try to do here is to not state the obvious, or at least we don't only state the obvious. So the textbook um, message, for example, it doesn't just say you need to read the textbook or you won't know things. Instead, the instructor helped us identify what he thinks are the most useful quiz um, types in the textbook. And so then we can say to students, if you're only using this type of quiz section in each chapter, you may not be preparing well for the exam because the exams are more likely modeled after this kind of quiz type. And same for um, the lecture message, which I think I have, no, I have that in a, in a future one. But we don't just say you need to show up. Instead, we go a little bit deeper. I'll talk about that one in a minute. Over on the right then are the um, messages that we give out before and after exams through a whole term. Um, again, just thinking about time, 
this is an example of the to-do list, which changes every week, and they can check them off. Um, and again, this is one of the uh, main places that instructors can plug in directly. Oh, this is a really hideous slide. So I threw this in here so you can see how we track everything. Um, this is, so this is a little look under the hood. So on the left is um, the schedule that we have for the overall semester. So you can see across the top, we have all of our courses and then down is a week by week look at the, um, at the messages. So the blue items have to do with exam messages, the green is everything else, red are actual exam dates, and orange is the research that we're doing. And so this is the way um, that I can say the featured message for Stats 250 this week is exam secrets, and next week I need to change it to problem roulette, and so on. And then the, the picture on the right is a deep dive into a particular individual course. And that's how we can keep track of the status of each message. So we know whether we've updated it, tested it and queued it and it's ready to go or if we need to talk to the instructor about something. And by the way, that hot pink is hideous on purpose because then I feel motivated to make it go away. Okay, so we also try to say things in the right way. This I think is, um, really new to instructors. And it's the thing that when we talk to them about eCoach, this is the kind of thing that resonates with them the most. This is the thing they feel like they don't know how to do. And so they're really grateful that we do this. So one of the strategies that we apply throughout eCoach messages is um, are some of the principles of motivational interviewing. Um, the, the other main writer and myself are both trained in motivational interviewing. And so we, um, we apply principles from it like an autonomy supportive tone. We don't tell them they have to do things or they must do things. Um, we give them choices and we say that their future is ultimately up to them, but that we're just telling them what we've heard so they can do with it what they please. We can do tailored reflections. Reflections are a huge part of motivational interviewing. We try to elicit change talk. So we might point out inconsistencies between what they want and their behaviors so that they might feel motivated to resolve those inconsistencies. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, we talk about importance, confidence. Um, we try to draw out their own motivations as well as to appeal to the strengths that they have reported to us. Over the years, I've worked with um, Ken Resnikow, who's here at the School of Public Health, and we've written lots and lots of MI-supported um, messages in a variety of behaviors in, in digital education programs. And these are just some of the examples of, um, I don't want to say rules, but kind of the guidelines that we've come up with to write in an MI consistent way, um, as opposed to a more um, should based or judgy way. I won't read all these to you, but um, if you're interested later, you can come back to them. We're also inspired by um, the books you can see on the right, Nudge, um, as well as the two books by Chip and Dan Heath. If you haven't read them, I highly, highly recommend them. Um, and, and, the, and the principles of plain language as well. So we try to have a clear core, a single core message for every message that we send out. We try to be concrete about the steps that students might take or how it might help them. We often tell, um, you know, give some of the advice in stories as opposed to just advice. Um, we avoid jargon, we use um, headings and bullets and white space as plain language dictates. And sometimes we have somebody else say it. We, um, at different times throughout eCoach's history and, and in a term, we collect um, testimonials from students because sometimes the way they say it is more credible than, than anybody else saying it. And sometimes we say things ever so gently. So this is an example of a message that's after exam two, and it would go to somebody who's gotten two Ds or worse in a row. And so it's just, the idea is just to be as soft as possible. We don't wanna overwhelm them with a hundred pieces of advice about how they might dig themselves out of this place. And so we just wanna to say to them, you know, you still have a lot of points left, your exams aren't cumulative, so each is like starting fresh. And there are a lot of resources on campus and people wanna help you. 
Okay, now we'll take a little closer look at a few. This is an example of a midterm progress message. So about halfway through the term, we might send this out in certain classes. And at the top, you can see some of the tailoring happening. Um, uh, we link out to the grade calculator to remind people about some of the features that eCoach has. And then all the scores in the middle are tailored. And those, um, the, the second, third, and fourth bullets are um, a look at their possible grades if they got 70s, 80s, or 90% from everything from that point forward. And so the idea is to kind of give them some hope that, okay, if they change some of their behaviors or really, um, you know, hunker down, they might be able to bring their grade up. And this particular person, um, as you can see, has a 51% right now. And by the way, we only show 70s or 80s for people whose scores are below that. So for example, if someone has a 95, I don't want to tell them that they can still get an A minus or whatever if they get 70s from here on out because that would be rather demotivating. This is an example of one of the histograms we can send people. To, and I think this one is particularly interesting for this um, this example student. So, you know, imagine you're a student in this course and you don't otherwise get this information. Um, most courses, I think Canvas can do this kind of thing, but most instructors don't use it, at least among our eCoach courses. And so the fact that they get this in eCoach, this person, for example, can look at this histogram and say like, oh, well, I guess maybe I need to spend more time on homework. And then you can see in the bottom, there are questions that um, we recommend, and each of those questions represents kind of a best practice based on what the instructors tell us to help them engage better with the homework. When someone is doing well in a category like this one, then instead of the um, questions to consider bullets, they might just get this sort of kudos paragraph. And each of these kudos paragraphs talks about um, the value proposition and why it's great that they're doing this. So here is an inside look at the tailoring engine. Um, this is an example of one bullet. So if we look back up here, one of these bullets, for example, um, could be tailored. This particular page is not, but this, this um, tailoring example is one from a lecture attendance histogram. And so you can see what happens is that um, the first row 65 people get the beginning of the bullet and then depending on the the motivator or the strength that they chose in the beginning of term survey they get the second question so this is just I just wanted to throw in kind of a, an example of the tailoring and so this is what that um, so if someone said that um, learning new things is a strength of theirs then they would get this bullet Here is another look at uh, a post-exam message. And again, I've called out just a couple of examples that are sort of interesting. So the top, this whole particular page is for people who were in the 64 to 74% range. And this person feels happy with their score. The reason I called this one out is because um, this is kind of a tricky situation. I don't know if the person actually is happy with their 64, or again, if they're just giving us sort of garbage information from their survey. So I sort of hedged my bets and I didn't say, yeah, it's an awesome score. Instead, I said, we're glad to hear you're not discouraged. It doesn't do any good anyway. Instead, let's focus on where to go from here. So it's sort of a little bit of like, you can still bounce back from this, but doesn't acknowledge that they said they were happy in case they weren't actually happy. And then on this page, uh, rows 28 to 31 are for the 75 to 86% range and then 32 down go to people who got over an 87%. And so um, this, in this orange box that I called out, this is a person who got, um, I think an A minus or better, but they said they were disappointed, or it might be a B plus, but they got a high grade and they said they were disappointed. And so we're trying to kind of build them back up and, and gently say that maybe they're being a little too hard on themselves, but this is actually a really great score.
Okay, this is an inside look at eCoach from the administrative console side. Um, you can see on the left, um, we have, the, on the left are sort of all the different pages that we have within the admin console. Um, and then the main part here, I can see how many people are enrolled in the course. That first part are all the resources and links that I can add to, so that they show up for the students in their homepage. Um, I can send tailored emails, I can set up surveys, and then the inbox way at the bottom there, it represents the messages that appear in somebody's, um, like all the tailored messages that somebody gets for in that message inbox. In terms of um, what we have in the admin console that we can use, um, one of the features that I really love is this um, content review panel. So on the left, I can change anybody's scores. It doesn't actually change it in the database, it's just a test bed. So I can put in whatever tailoring characteristics I want and then the message on the right changes. And you can kind of see at the bottom there, it tells me which things um, this particular message is motivated, is, um, sorry, tailored on, I saw the word motivator there. And um, this is how I can test um, not only the formatting and grammar and how the sentences are coming together, but also the tailoring and whether the people are getting the right messages or the right sentences are coming together. This is um, the grade book. We pull grades in directly from Canvas. And um, you can see some things here, like um, it already knows how much each component is gonna be worth. And then I don't know if you can see this drop lowest one <clears throat> phrase here. That's how we can set up um, sort of smarter versions of grading schemes. So I know Canvas can do certain things, but we have a really, I don't know, fairly complicated ability to do different kinds of grading schemes that are, that were designed specifically for the instructors who use eCoach. So some of them weight the exams extremely differently and then whichever score someone is, the, whichever scheme is giving someone the high score, that's what we show in that grade calculator. We also have um, an analytics section in our admin console. So the top image shows um, when people have read a certain message. So each message would get this um, same kind of image. And you can see when a message spikes, um, and sometimes it might have more than one spike, which is kind of interesting. So we can kind of pick apart when people are looking at the messages and, and um, you know, you can see impact of emails. There might be a spike right after we send an email out or two days before an exam or what have you. On the bottom left, this is, um, these are some data that we get around our, um, uh, the exam playbook. We can see when people are finishing each of the components and on which days. And then on the right, um, those are some <clears throat> analytics we can get around our um, randomized control trials to make sure that the different research arms are balanced and which demographic groups are completing it for each course. Okay, now I'll talk a little bit about the research that we're doing and how we work with researchers. So the first category um, that I'll talk about is the user research that we do. So uh, about a year and a half ago, we invited some users to come in and, and talk to, um, not myself, but an independent group um, some of our user experience folks who don't have anything to do with eCoach. And we ask them what kinds of things they get out of it, why they like it, which features they like the best. And what you can see, the theme that I see in, in not only the entire report, but also these examples, is that eCoach gives them something they don't get anywhere else. So it's not content that they get from Canvas. It's not what they might get on the internet anywhere else. It's unique, and that's why they like it. We also invited non-users to talk to us. Um, and what we see here is, um, so this first one I would say is that uh, this particular student thinks that eCoach is for someone else. It's not in their identity to use it. Uh, the second one um, hurts my soul because this person said um, that he, he wants um, he wants to know which study resources we would rank and prioritize, and that's 
exactly what eCoach does. So it, it hurts my soul that he doesn't use it, even though that's what he wants it to do. Um, but I guess that's on us for, um, you know, not letting, for not being clear about what value it might bring each student. Or maybe for using email as a way to let people know, which may not be the most popular way to communicate with, with folks in this age group. Um, and then the last one um, is a really common one that we hear, which is that eCoach feels like an assignment or just something more to do. So these are, these are really interesting for us to think about and to you know, strategize about how we get our message out in a better way or make it feel like a true support as opposed to just more work. And we continue to do this kind of work um, regularly so we can stay tuned into what, what people are saying about it. This, um, this image I kind of threw in for the same reason as our um, master calendar. This was um, my notebook when I was trying to send out a single email to invite non-users to come in and talk to us. So next to the number one, it says empty motivators. That is logic that I use to say that someone has not completed the beginning of term survey. Next to number two are all the message codes, the numbers of the messages to tell me that people didn't read either the controllable points message or the exam one pre-message. And they're different for every course and they're different every semester. So I needed to remember the right message number so that I could write logic around people not reading those. Next to number three is that their current score is less than an A minus. If someone is not using eCoach but they're getting an A plus, that wouldn't have been as useful to us to kind of get insights about why people aren't using it. So we wanted to specifically target people who were at a B plus and below. And in every course, a B plus is a different score. So I also had to tailor on the different score percents. So I always think this is a pretty funny image for me to send quite literally a single email. The second kind of um, research that we work on um, on an ongoing basis are randomized studies. So here are three um, impact studies that we did on eCoach. Um, these were actually before my day, but they're out there in the literature and I think they're a pretty interesting view on um, the early days of eCoach. It's changed a lot since then, but um, I included them here in case you wanna go back later and check them out. They all pretty much refer to this same graphic which um, breaks down users into high users, moderate users, low users, and non-users. And what we find is that greater use had, um, students who used it more had higher, better than expected scores. And the reason that we use better than expected mostly um, as an outcome is because if we used GPA, we wouldn't really know what the impact was because we have theoretically changed it. And so what we do instead is um, we use a historical, we use historical data to um, make predictions about a score that someone might have gotten based on their characteristics and then calculate how much better they did based on eCoach use. I'm sure I just butchered that description, but it's, it's, it's explained quite well in those other articles. This is why I'm a writer and not a data scientist. Um, we wanted to refresh our impact a little bit. And so um, we, we worked on this chart just a couple of months ago. This does use GPA, so it's not a perfect measure, but it does show that students who use eCoach earn about a third of a letter grade higher than students who didn't. So we feel like we're still on the right track. We've also done a whole bunch of interventions and we're continuing to do a whole lot more. Now, unfortunately on this slide, I can explain a whole bunch of really interesting things, but then I'm gonna do that annoying thing where I can't tell you anything about the results because they're either in process or in uh, under review, or we haven't gotten because to them because we're under a mountain range of data. But we did, we tested um, a values affirmation exercise and a growth mindset exercise, with it, which are both um, psychological writing exercises to mitigate performance differences either between men and women or <clears throat> underrepresented minorities and so on. We also did a utility value exercise 
which is also a writing exercise, but that one was for, um, I think it's generally found to be effective for lower performers. So we've tested those, um, each of those three in large randomized, randomized control trials. We've also done um, a nudge study. So the uh, image on the top right, we showed people when they started their homework versus when everyone else in the class started their homework. And half of the group got the average of everyone else and the other half of the group got um, the, the start date of people who did as well as them or better. And that paper is um, in, uh, under review right now. Um, we also did a goal setting survey where half the people got a normative statement that said something like last semester or usually X percent of people get an A minus or better on homework. What do you want to get on homework? And the other half did not get that normative statement. They just asked what goal they want to get on homework. So we're trying to see what happens there. The interesting thing I want to see is whether, whether people, when, if people set lower goals, if that's realism, if they say, oh, only 60% got A minuses or better, I, you know, I better set a realistic goal. And then if they work harder, or if saying 60% of people only got A minus, if that's demotivating. So that'll be something that we're going to look for in, in those data. We've also tested commitment devices. So if we can spread out extra credit by signing people up with a friend versus a stranger, does that encourage them to complete the playbook more effectively? Um, and then I also developed, uh, last fall I developed a, an intervention that for lack of a better phrase, we called, why didn't I get a higher grade? Our instructors regularly said that in the, if I had a dollar for every time conversation, they said they wish they had a dollar for every time a student came in their office and sat down and said, but I read the textbook. I went to lecture. I went to lab. I went to discussion. I did all the practice quizzes, but I still got a D. Why did I get a D? And so this intervention really tries to break down what the instructor would do in that moment, which is to say, okay, well, let's talk about how you use the textbook. Did you do this, that, and the other? Let's talk about what you did in lecture. Were you looking at Facebook and shopping or were you taking notes? Did you write things in your own words? Did you copy out the course pack and look at the slides ahead of time and so on? And so then we're giving them feedback about their own ratings of their kind of earnest um, use of each of the course resources. Another big theme of the research we're doing is we're trying to open the black box. So right now, eCoach is sort of this monolith that is an intervention that treats people. And we want to try to break out which are the pieces that are the magic sauce or which ones work better than others or which ones are actually helping people. And this is a paper that one of our um, partners did. Um, he presented this at LAC a while back. And what he found is um, that the exam playbook which here is represented by exam prep, as well as the to-do list, which here is represented by get things done. Um, those two features helped to get students out of moderate academic distress. So that's the, what you see as the explore column. And then under the engage column, those are students who are in severe academic distress. And for that group, he found that regular use of problem roulette, which is that practice tool, the exam playbook, and then the exam reflection helped students get out of um, severe academic distress. So this was pretty exciting to see that indeed some of our eCoach features are helping people get out of trouble in a class. Um, this is also, um, I mentioned some of the research that Patricia Chen, who's in Singapore, has done on the exam playbook. This is, um, this is an example of that. She found that students who were randomly, so this was before it was part of eCoach, but it was delivered over Qualtrics and still in an eCoach course. And so students who were randomly assigned to receive the playbook were more self-reflective about their learning. They used resources better in the course to study for their exams. And they got about a third of a letter grade better than the students who didn't use 
or who weren't assigned to the playbook. Um, another theme to our research is that we want to know our audience better. We want to know who's using eCoach. We want to know more about them so that we can tailor appropriately so that we might think about different features to add. And so what you can see here is for each course, there are two columns or two bars. So take biology 171, for example, the left bar represents the whole course and the right bar represents those who have opted into eCoach. So then if you scan across, you can see that we're pretty close. One of the things that we always said kept us up at night for a long time was whether we're only really enrolling the A students. And this is showing us that our enrollment is really pretty close to representative of the actual students in the class. So that was pretty exciting. Similarly, we're trying to make sure that we're close on gender. This, in fact, looks like more women sign up for eCoach. Um, this is an example of um, a chart that, um, well, there's a series of these, but this one is about what it looks like um, in different courses um, based on how interested people are in the subject or how useful they think it are, the subject is. And so what this one tells me is that computer science courses do a really good job of making it clear the real world value of what they learn and some of the other ones less so. So it's not that I would develop any sort of intervention out of this. It's just interesting to think about how we might tailor differently in the different courses to know that say in Chem 130 or Stats 250, part of the message that we might send to people is more about how those topics might be useful to them in their future career. Um, this chart is about, um, so this, this is an example of a really interesting insight that we got from an instructor. We said, uh, what's the earliest you think you can see a red flag for anyone in your course? And without hesitation, they said, somebody score on project one. If they don't get 100% on project one, they're probably in trouble. And that's for a variety of reasons. One is that they probably haven't set up their, um, their coding environment properly and or they don't set up the right habits to say that to make use of the auto grader and to say, I'm gonna take advantage of the 5% extra credit that I get for turning the project in two days ahead of time and so on. And what we see here in these graphs is on the right are the students who got 100%. And you can see that the scores lean toward the right, which is um, the, you know, uh, the higher sco scores, higher grades. And the green box on the left is all the students who didn't get 100%. And you can see the distribution of scores across those students is much more spread out and leans toward the left end. So it turns out they were right. This was just one of those really fascinating things we did to say, okay, score on project one, definitely a teachable moment. We need to put some context around that e-coach that people know that this is a really important um, moment. And by the way, not getting 100%, you know, obviously that does include people who got 98%. So, so that's an example of how an e-coach we can give context. Someone might think, be really proud of this 98%, but we can say, in fact, that's not, you know, that we want you to think about that 98% a little bit differently, and here's why. Okay, so um, before I take questions, if you have any, um, I wanted to put together some kind of high level thoughts because if I understand correctly, I think some or most or all of you are thinking about developing something similar to eCoach. And so I was trying to think about what we've learned over the years that I would recommend to all of you to think about. And the first is to be deliberate about your approach. I think a lot of times when you start to develop an intervention, you can just sort of, um, you don't really choose what, how you will present your source of the message, whether it's from the instructor or a different writer or a project. Um, so for example, our eCoach messages are written from eCoach and we sign them from the eCoach team. And the tone that we have chosen, I jokingly call cool aunt instead of nagging mother. Um, 
I would also encourage you to be deliberate about your audience. Do you, like in our case, do you want the entire class or do you only want to target students who are below a certain threshold in a grade? I don't have the right answers to these things. I'm just suggesting that it's probably important to think about what these are and then make, um, you know, mindful decisions about them. Also incentives, how you'll incentivize people if it's credit, extra credit, or if you incentivize them by, um, encouraging them or requiring them to use certain features to get information on the course and then hope that the rest of the engagement follows. There's a whole variety of ways to do it. The other um, piece to be deliberate about, I guess, is um, whether your writing, decision making, um, and the interventions and the research you do is centralized or decentralized. If it's decentralized, you can actually you know, obviously get a lot more content done and more research done, but then you also kind of lose that control. And so in, in writing, for example, it may be that once you have 20 writers instead of just two writers, that the fidelity of the messages becomes very different and you may not actually have the same interventions anymore. It's just something to consider, not that it's right or wrong. I would also encourage you to think ahead of time about what you're going to need from partners. Um, and, you know, again, my recommendations are sort of just coming from what we learned from eCoach, but over time, we have really seen that to work effectively, we need a particular kind of data flow. We need a particular kind of way that they use Canvas. Muting and unmuting grades can mean great things for eCoach or terrible things for eCoach. And then if some GSIs put in zeros for missing grades and some just leave it blank, that can mean better and worse things for the tailoring engine because we can't make sense of what a zero is or a null is. Um, we also, you know, require regular meetings so that we can stay up on the courses and make sure that we're not giving students incorrect information. Um, and it's also helpful when the instructor we're working with has some influence over the course and can help us encourage other instructors um, what to tell them and when to talk about eCoach and how to um, recommend it and such. So knowing ahead of time what you might need from partners and whether they use Canvas or Blackboard or something else and how much that matters and when you're going to, if you're going to have, you know, data coming in on a regular basis, thinking ahead a little bit about that stuff might help you um, know the difference between picking a great partner and a troublesome partner. Um, as everything, the devil is in the details. Um, this, you know, I don't, I don't know anything about any of your projects really, but just an example, some examples from eCoach, every single term, Canvas links change. And so if in an eCoach message, we link out to a particular folder in Canvas, we have to change that every single term. Um, dates for exams change, not only between fall and winter, but also every year. So every, every, you know, every different term, we have to change all that stuff. And we've decided it's worth it. But as you're setting up details in, in your programs, you know, bear in mind what, what will need to be touched every single term or for every single student and whether that's worth it for you. I already mentioned some of the Canvas gradebook nuances in terms of muting, unmuting, and zeros and nulls. Um, and then we have this really strange situation every now and then. Right now we have an undergrad student who's helping us to manage some of the content in Physics 140. And she happens to also be enrolled in our stats class. She's helping with content in one eCoach course, but she's taking another eCoach course. So behind the scenes, we have to scramble and say, how can we make sure that the data is safe so that she can't see the grades and information of her fellow students and you know, every semester we come up with some new weird situation like this that we have to figure out that we hadn't thought about before. And the last thing I'm sure this will not shock you is, but um, it, you will get mountains and mountains and mountains and mountains of data. We have, you know, we have click streams. We have lots and lots of surveys. We know things about them from Canvas. We know things about them from the data warehouse. We have more data than the entire population of the world could ever make it through. And so chances are you will have the same experience. 
And so my recommendation is to hire approximately 12 times more data scientists than you think you need. And that's it. Thank you so much, Holly. Let's give her a round of applause. One of the things when you're giving these remote talks is that you can't really hear the audience responding. Right, um, yeah, that was a little strange. That's, that's slightly weird, but um, they, we were, we were. Um, okay. Okay, I'm gonna ask people, uh, just take a, a few minutes just to grab Holly before we break and before she we let her go home for dinner. If you wanna come and ask a question, come up here please and we'll, we can ask it through here. Okay, so quickly if you want to come up and follow up with something. Hi, Holly. Uh, Steve Likewise from the University of Auckland. Um, thank you for the very fascinating talk and to hear more about eCoach. I, I knew it had been on the horizon and I had always wanted to hear more about your approach. You um, had talked about the eight courses that you work with. Mm -hmm. uh, is there more than eight and is there any intention or desire to scale um, the use of eCoach? to more courses at University of Michigan? So I guess technically we had nine. Um, one of them is paused um, because of two people having babies. Um, and one of the courses, um, Econ 101, we actually have two sections. So we have two separate coaches. Our Econ 101 classes are such that they don't have the same exams, they don't follow the same schedule. And so we treated them as very separate courses. Um, so it's seven or eight or nine, depending on how you want to count it. Um, we also had a coach for a while in a, in a one credit, um, liberal arts class that was on setting yourself up for an internship. That one didn't work all that well, I think because, um, the scale was pretty small. There were only 25 students in it. And I think eCoach is better, better set for really large courses where the instructors really need be coach to help them. Um, as for branching out, yes, I we're we're thinking about new courses that we might add. Um, until this point, we've you know kind of we've been setting up and getting everything in order, and so we've just been um, kind of limited by the number of people we have and um, and how many coaches each of us can handle maintaining per semester, but. I think we've streamlined a lot and we now have a quality assurance person who has taken on some of that, um, some of the really small details like changing links and dates and, and looking over that horrific um, uh, master calendar that I showed you all. And that is taking a huge load off. And so then I will have more time to do content strategy and, and, and fire up more coaches. And, and a follow-up question, if I can. Um, do you work with learning designers um, in conjunction with the lecturers? And how much does the learning design of the courses change um, as you deliver the course, it, the iterative delivery of the course? So we have, um, we have learning experience designers on staff at Academic Innovation. Um, and they have not officially been part of the eCoach team before now, although I can certainly see um, a value for including them. So that's actually the moment I was asked to give this talk, I started thinking about that because um, um, I think it could be hugely valuable. Until now, when it came to the, the learning objectives and the learning design of the course, we relied on the instructor. And probably the main reason that we haven't included um, learning designers until this point is because we don't actually focus on what they're learning in the course. Instead, we're focusing on the behaviors that lead to the learning. So I'm not saying they're mutually exclusive and that we shouldn't include designers. I think we should. Um, and it's a great point. And I, I think we'll, that's something that we're going to start to look into for the next term. Uh, hi, uh, Andrei Masnikov here, UCS graduate student, uh, and during my studies, I uh, recovered around 70% of uh, assignments which were group work. 
And I noticed that your uh, tool works usually with uh, individual assignments. And my question is uh, how you are going to work uh, with uh, group work assignments? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there are a couple of messages in the computer science courses we have that talk specifically about working well in groups. Um, but that's um, a drop in the ocean for sure. Um, we've recognized this as a common problem and um, we actually have recently launched a brand new project inspired by eCoach that specifically supports students who are working in groups. Um, it's called Tandem. We just launched it in January, so we're about three weeks in. And it is a tool that's, we hope, just as useful for instructors as it is for students. So from the student side, um, they'll get weekly lessons that are about group project based issues um, like trust, communication, um, sharing ideas, the value of diversity on teams. Um, and every week they take, uh, they do a team check. We ask them five questions to kind of take a temperature of how their team is doing. And then that feeds into what we hope is useful for the instructor side, which is that people will be put into different buckets of whether they're doing okay, they're approaching trouble or they need help so that the instructors can then see which teams they might reach out to and why. So that temperature check might tell them that the team is having trouble with logistics. They're just not able to meet or that one person is taking over or that somebody feels left out or whatever it might be. Thank you. Okay, Holly, I think we're gonna to need to wrap it up at that point. Um, okay. That was incredibly rich. Uh, you may not consider yourself a UX LX person, but I think what we were seeing there was a beautiful example of how they come together. Um, and I think we'll be gonna be replaying that um, a lot in the future just to try and unpack some of those points. So we do appreciate the time you put into that. And um, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Yeah, thanks so much.